Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena, and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to speak here. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, I want to talk to you about random Diophantine equations and some joint work with uh, Pierre Le Boudec and Will Savin. Uh, so Pierre reminded me, actually, that we started thinking about this project on June the 2nd in 2017. So that's almost exactly three years ago, and we finally put the paper on the archive this morning. I've spoken about this a couple of times before, uh, but I've, uh, we've, we've sort of been constantly trying to squeeze the most that we can out of the method. And I think we, we've now, as, a, as, a, as, a, as you can see on the archive, we've put, down, uh, we've put this to rest. So, um, oops, let me just, this uh, talk is all about Diophantine equations. So these are just polynomial equations with integer coefficients. And we want to understand uh, when we have integer or possibly rational uh, solutions to these equations. So I'm gonna keep this uh, talk fairly colloquial. Um, I think to keep the analytic number theorists happy, I uh, will certainly in introduce some iterated logarithms. I might change the order of summation at some point but the rest will be at a very uh, sort of gentle pace i want to start by talking a little bit about the decidability problem uh, for this question i will focus on cubic equations uh, for a little bit and then i'll talk about the main result and and how it's proved using the geometry of numbers so the kind of famous result or question here is goes back to Hilbert in his famous address at the turn of the previous century, previous but last century. And he asks for an algorithm uh, about whether you can, uh, given any uh, Diophantine or any polynomial with integer coefficients, can you decide whether or not there's an integer solution? So this is known when the number of variables is very small, so if a polynomial is in one variable. And it's also known if the degree is at most two, in fact, it was a nice observation of Scholem using uh, the non-negativity non of the squares. And in fact, it suffices to always assume that you've got polynomials of degree at most four. That's, that's an example there involving the uh, Mordell curve. But we now know this, this dream of Hilbert is, uh, can't, can't be attained. There's no general algorithm for deciding uh, whether or not any given Diophantine equation has a solution. And in the absence of that, um, we're left with finding uh, perhaps classes of Diophantine equations for which we can exhibit algorithms. Um, but I want to point out that even in the case of very simple quad quadratic equations, it's just a quadratic equation in two variables, there remains much that's unknown. Um, so there's a, a nice paper of uh, Jeff Legarius from the 80s uh, who discussed the, uh, the algorithm for deciding the solubility of the negative Pell equation. So um, here you, you just look at the continued fraction of D and um, the equation is soluble uh, if and only if the period um, of the continued fraction expansion is odd. And in fact, Ligarius proved that this is an NP algorithm so if you manage to come up with a polynomial time algorithm, you'll have in particular solve this thorny issue of P is equal to NP. I think it's unknown whether or not this is in NP uh, complete, but uh, just wanted to illustrate that even in the case of degree two equations, there's much that's unknown. So the, the kind of main test for solubility that's gonna motivate this talk uh, comes from uh, the most obvious uh, necessary condition for solubility. Namely, it should be soluble over all of the completions of Q. So it should be soluble over the reals and over all of the piadics. Or if you like, at modulo every prime power, there should be a solution. So we say that a class of polynomials satisfies the Hasse principle um, if this necessary condition is also sufficient. And this is a nice thing to have. Uh, when you know that a, a class of polynomials satisfies the Hasse principle, because this is in fact a decidable problem. So let me discuss it briefly in the case of uh, decidability over the p-addicts. 
So for this, you just want to pick a large prime P such that this um, polynomial remains irreducible when you reduce it modulo P. Then by invoking the uh, Langve estimates, which are sort of generalization of the, uh, the resolution of the uh, Riemann hypothesis for curves, um, this tells you that the number of FP points on your, uh, on your hypersurface, or the number of FP solutions to this equation, can be approximated by P to the n minus one, uh, plus a, an error term, which is smaller. So in particular, again, if P is large enough, that's enough to guarantee that there's a solution over this finite field um, in which the, uh, the partial derivatives of your polynomial uh, don't all vanish. And now you appeal to uh, Hensel's lemma, which really just goes back to, uh, to Isaac Newton, I think, um, and that allows you to lift these uh, FP solutions to get genuine solutions over QP. Okay, so large primes, uh, you automatically get p adic solubility. And then for the finitely many, and in fact, all of these constants can be made uh, explicit. And then for the finitely many small primes, you just use a computer or do it by hand. So in principle, this, uh, this has a principle uh, is, is decidable. Um, nonetheless, it's very, uh, um, so they still present, diagonal equations still present lots of, of, of challenges, even uh, in uh, relatively benign uh, instances like uh, uh, quadratic equations, as I've discussed, and, and cubic equations. So this is a, a question I like a lot, which integers um, are representable as a sum of three cubes. So the local condition here, the local test, is that your integer shouldn't be plus or minus four mod nine. And uh, we saw a beautiful talk by Drew Sutherland um, in this series um, uh, a, few, a few weeks ago. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of very beguiling problem because uh, for some k, uh, you get very small solutions. So if you take k to be three, um, it's not very hard to work out what the smallest solution is in that case. But if you take other values of k, uh, such as the number 42, it took an enormous amount of uh, ingenuity. Uh, and computer power um, to actually write down the smallest solution. One might ask about other cubic polynomials um, representing integers. Um, and in fact, you, you get a different story sometimes. So um, here we're asking about representations of integers as sum of three squares minus um, the product of the variables x, y, z. Again, the local test, it's quite easy to work out that um, provided k is not three mod four and not plus or minus three mod nine, that's enough to guarantee solubility um, uh, over all of the piadics. But nonetheless, um, this is not necessarily enough to guarantee that there are solutions over the integers. And there's a very nice paper by uh, Gosh and Sinek a few years ago, who actually proved for this particular equation, that there are infinitely many counterexamples uh, to the Hassel principle. So it'd be interesting to, to figure out what's going on in these kinds of cases, and I think this is not completely understood. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, irreducible, homogeneous Diophantine equations. Um, so all of, the monomial, all of the monomials have the same degree, and this has the effect that talking about uh, solubility over the integers is the same thing as talking about solubility over the rational numbers. And uh, the motivation is going to be to ask about uh, this test, this sort of HASA principle uh, uh, for random equations. Um, let me motivate this by a discussion of cubic equations, homogeneous cubic equations, and I'm going to start by those which define um, curves, so those in dimension one. So for us, a cubic curve is going to be uh, a homogeneous polynomial of degree three, the locus of zeros of a polynomial of degree three, which is homogeneous. So one of the mantras in uh, Diophantine geometry is that uh, the complex geometry of the 
variety cut out by the equation, the polynomial equation, should have a very strong effect on the uh, arithmetic of the problem. And we see this quite uh, distinctly here. So um, the problem's very easy if you've got a singular cubic curve. Um, so first of all, uh, if, if your curve is irreducible, um, you, it's not hard to see that you always have a unique singularity. Um, if there were two singularities, two double points, then the line joining the two double points would hit the cubic curve in four points, uh, which is impossible by Pazut's theorem, assuming the curve is irreducible. So it contains a unique singularity, and then by, uh, let's go to this singularity has to be invariant under the Galois group, um, and so this is actually always going to be a rational point uh, on the cubic curve. So singular cubic curves always have a rational point, and in fact, you can use this uh, rational point to parameterize uh, all of the rational points and find that your curve is, is really just a copy of P1. Uh, things are much, uh, much more subtle for non-singular cubic curves, and there's a famous example here of Selma, which I'm sure you've seen before, uh, which shows that this local test is not sufficient in general, so it doesn't, um, there are failures of the Hauser principle. Uh, let's move to dimension, oh no, stick with curves. Um, individual curves, difficult to um, analyze, uh, sort of many questions uh, about them. Um, Bhargava started seriously looking at um, answering these types of questions uh, on average, and uh, this will motivate what comes later. Uh, so this is a, a result I like a lot, um, and he has proved that if you uh, order all ternary cubic forms uh, by height, uh, so all ternary cubic forms over the rational numbers by height, then a positive proportion of these actually have um, non-trivial solutions over the rational numbers. So this is a tour de force which uh, builds on his work with Shankar on the average size of three Selma groups of elliptic curves and his work with Skinner showing that a positive proportion of elliptic curves actually have rank one. Um, so in the paper he also uh, postulates a, a conjecture um, that I've written it in a, in a fairly strange way but um, the, the exact proportion of cubic curves which have a rational point um, should be one third times uh, 0.97. This should be the proportion of cubic curves which are soluble over Q. So the 0.97 actually comes through joint work with Manjul and uh, John Cremona and Tom Fisher, where they calculate the exact probability that a ternary cubic form passes all of the local tests. So it's locally soluble everywhere. So 97% of uh, plane cubic curves are everywhere locally soluble. And among these, uh, Bhagavad conjectures that precisely a third of those actually have rational points. So this third sort of comes out of the method and is related to um, sort of rank distribution conjectures of Goldfeld. Katz and Sarnak. Okay, so now I think we're moving to dimension two. Um, <clears throat> so cubic curves were homogeneous cubic polynomials in three variables. Cubic surfaces are homogeneous cubic polynomials in four variables. And again, we have this dichotomy between um, singular and non-singular surfaces. So the singular ones are easier, um, provided you stay away from cones. I think uh, cones over genus one curves will be no easier than looking at uh, uh, the arithmetic of genus one curves. But uh, so the geometry of singular cubic surfaces is very classical. Um, you always have at most, uh, well, uh, assuming that it's, uh, it's, it's a normal cubic surface, you always have at most four singularities. Um, it was proved a, over 50 years ago that the Hasse principle always holds for these um, cubic surfaces. 
I've illustrated one of my favorites. This is the uh, Cayley cubic surface. It has the maximum number of singularities um, and it has a, a bunch of uh, rational points uh, on, this, on this cubic surface. So the non-singular cubic surfaces uh, are much more uh, recalcitrant. Um, we, we know that the, the Hasse principle can fail for these cubic surfaces, um, but we expect, and in fact this is a conjecture of um, uh, Sansuk and uh, uh, Collier Tillen from the 1980s, that the only way that it can fail is if the Brouwer group associated to the cubic surface um, is non-trivial. Um, whereas for singular cubic surfaces, we've had some success at even uh, understanding the distribution of rational points on those cubic surfaces. Non-singular cubic surfaces are much harder. Um, 3D printed, I don't know if you see my video, but I 3D printed uh, a cubic surface here. This is the Klebsch cubic surface and all the pink dots correspond to um, rational points on these, uh, on this cubic surface. Uh, we have uh, very little idea about how they're distributed. I mean, we have lots of conjectures, um, but um, relatively few proofs. Um, so I wanted to point out that, yes, we'll sort of underline the point that understanding individual non-singular cubic surfaces um, is difficult. Um, so this is one of the strongest results in this direction that we have. Um, I'm focusing attention on diagonal cubic surfaces. So I assume that it just has these four uh, cubic monomials and they're all cube free. And Swinnett and Dyer at the turn of the millennium was able to show that these cubic surfaces uh, admit rational points, assuming that uh, they pass all of the local tests for solubility, plus some extra explicit conditions on the coefficients, which I'm not going to record here. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a very strong result, but as with many of these results in this area, it's highly conditional. So he has to assume that the Teichabarevich group um, is finite for any elliptic curve. That's a big open problem in, in number theory. Um, so in the 80s, uh, Collier, Tulen, Konevsky, and Sonsuk made a detailed study of diagonal cubic surfaces, and they explored what the Brouwer group or the brown mannin obstruction has to say about uh, solubility for these surfaces. And so the calculation, one of the calculations they did was to show that um, this obstruction is empty, so there is no obstruction to uh, the Hasse principle. If, well, whenever you have a single prime p, which divides uh, one of the coefficients to the first power, to p adic valuation one, and doesn't divide any of the other coefficients. So one consequence of that is that uh, failures of the Hasse principle in this particular family should be exceedingly rare. Um, if you think about it, you can only possibly have a brown manin obstruction if whenever there's a prime dividing one of the coefficients, either its square divides the coefficient or it divides um, another, uh, one of the other coefficients. And that places a very strong multiplicative constraint on the coefficients. And it's not very hard to show that, uh, well, assuming this big conjecture that the Brouwer group explains um, failures of the Hasse principle, that the proportion of failures should, be, should uh, decay like one over b squared. Um, nonetheless, uh, so this is a sort of conditional result about cubic surfaces, but it is still possible to prove um, unconditional results about um, uh, the existence of rational points on cubic surfaces. And in fact, you're able to prove uh, examples of families of diagonal cubic surfaces for which we always have a rational point. Um, 
So uh, there's a result by Heath, Brown and Moroz, um, uh, which states that if you have the coefficients one, two, a, b, and you assume that a is congruent to plus or minus b mod nine, then this cubic surface always has rational points. So this, this is really a, uh, a, a sort of high point of marrying sort of heavy analytic machinery with uh, sort of work on Higner points in elliptic curves. So there's a result by Satjay who shows that um, the cubic equation x naught cubed plus 2x1 cubed equal to p for a prime p congruent to 2 mod 9 always has a rational point. So if you're able to produce prime values of your binary cubic form in the right congruence class, um, then you're able to deduce the existence of rational points on this surface. So I was sort of inspired by this and by the works of uh, Bhargava to think about a, a similar family. So here I'm looking at a family of cubic surfaces which are of the shape binary cubic form equal to a binary cubic form in disjoint variables. And, uh, and one can show that uh, in this family, um, a positive proportion of them actually have rational points, basically by reducing it to a problem about curves in a fairly obvious way. So it would, it, in the same spirit of the Heath Brown Moroz paper, it's sufficient here to just study the, uh, the cubic curves in P2, which look like binary cubic form equal to a cube. And then you can exploit um, a connection with uh, these J invariant zero Mordell curves. Um, and one finds that uh, soluble cubic curves of this special shape with given discriminant actually um, correspond to um, the image of uh, this E mod phi E in the phi Selma group of this Mordell curve. So this, this curve has a, has a sort of obvious three isogeny. And then you can appeal to uh, work of um, Chris and Lee who actually are able to show unconditionally that a positive proportion of these um, Mordell curves have positive rank. Okay, um, so let me stick with cubics for a little bit longer um, and under the uh, philosophy that any uh, mathematics talk should always contain a proof, um, let me uh, present the following result. So I want to introduce some notation which uh, will be used later as well. So curly F of A with subscripts D and N this is the space of all homogeneous degree D polynomials in N plus one variables with integer coefficients and whose coefficients all have modulus at most A. So A here is a, a parameter that will be tending to infinity. So the theorem is about cubic surfaces is that when you order these cubic surfaces uh, by height, you actually get that a positive proportion of them are soluble uh, over the rational numbers. Okay, so that sounds like quite an impressive result, but it follows very easily from, uh, from Bhargava's uh, result about cubic curves that I mentioned earlier. So we're interested in estimating the number of uh, cubic polyno polynomials, cubic forms in four variables, which have a rational um, uh, solution. I can lower bound that by just counting the number of cubic polynomials in four variables, which have a rational solution in which the last variable is zero. The last coordinate is zero. Um, so there are 10 monomials in uh, cubic surfaces which, have, uh, which involve uh, the X3 variable. Um, so I can easily, so I essentially have a, a, a free sum over 10 of the, the coefficients and I get a lower bound of the shape greater than greater than a to the 10 now times the number of cubic polynomials in only three variables which have a rational point 
or have a rational solution. And that's uh, exactly the content of Bhargava's result. And he showed that there was a positive proportion, which just means that uh, there's a lower bound of the shape of constant times a to the 10. There are 10 monomials in any uh, cubic uh, polynomial in three, three variables. And so that gives you the result. Um, now let me get on to uh, talking about uh, the, uh, the main result uh, that we've been working on. So again, it's the same, same notation as before. Curly F is the space of all of these uh, homogeneous degree D polynomials in N plus one variables with integer coefficients and height at most A. So then the result is that provided that we're in the so-called Fano range, so the number N um, should be at least D, and we have to exclude the case of cubic surfaces, so the case D and N being three, and that's, okay, it's unfortunate, but we have to exclude the case of cubic surfaces, then the proportion of um, polynomials which have a rational point tends to a constant C sub dn as a goes to infinity and this constant has a nice description uh, if you're outside the setting of plane conics it admits a description as a product of local densities and a positive product of local densities and if you're in the setting of plane conics, this constant is zero. So that was already well known. That's a nice result of Serre from the 90s that a random plane conic um, doesn't have any rational points. So I won't define these densities here, but uh, sigma p, uh, for example, is the probability that um, a homogeneous degree d polynomial in n plus one variables has a qp point. So another way of saying this um, is that, again, if you make the same assumption, so n is at least d, uh, we're not looking at cubic surfaces anymore. When you order these all by height, 100% of them satisfy the Hasse principle. Okay, so while uh, previously we saw some instances of counterexamples to the Hasse principle, this is at least confirming that these counterexample, counterexamples are rare uh, for this range of N and D. So in fact, this, uh, this question or this result goes back to a question uh, or to a paper uh, of Poonen and Volokh, and this influenced me a lot. I think this was just when I was finishing my PhD. It was a conference, one of my first conferences at, uh, at AIM about rational points. And um, this was one of the, the things that was discussed there. So they conject, made this conjecture that it should be true uh, for all n greater than or equal to d, including cubic surfaces. And they also had a nice argument which showed that it follows from a very general conjecture of Collier to Len. Uh, so if you've not seen that conjecture before, that states that if you have any rationally connected uh, variety, uh, the brown man and obstruction should be the only obstruction to the Hasse principle. So if you take that on faith, actually it tells you something much stronger in the setting of Fano hypersurfaces, because uh, one can show that if n is at least four and x happens to be non-singular, which certainly happens 100% of the time, then this Brouwer group is trivial. So therefore, uh, according to the conjecture of Collier Len, the Hasse principle uh, should always hold. Actually, in the light of that, it's possibly interesting to comment on the error term in uh, this theorem. Um, I suppose if, if, so if it follows from this argument based on uh, Collier Len's conjecture that, that this should be true. Uh, for all n greater than or equal to d, uh, certainly with an error term, which is polynomial, polynomial decay in A. So we're not able to obtain polynomial decay in A in this result, but we do at least get some explicit power of a logarithm. Um, 
I guess as I was preparing these slides, it occurred to me, it'd be interesting to think about what one might expect in a slightly more general context. So if you give yourself a, a family, uh, if you have some smooth uh, projective variety Z with a morphism down to some projective space, uh, one might ask about what's the probability that a random fiber satisfies the Hasse principle. So I think it really only makes sense if you put some conditions on the family. So I'm uh, assuming that Z itself is everywhere locally soluble seems to be a fairly basic assumption. Um, I guess you would want the fibers to be rationally connected, perhaps. Um, but it'd be interesting to uh, to think about what one might expect here. Um, so at least the local solubility uh, condition or result here has been worked out in joint work with Martin Bright and Dan Lochran. So if you assume that over every co-dimension one point in such a family, um, the fiber is irreducible, um, then you can at least show that uh, sort of using a, a the sort of civil Vecadal type machinery, that a positive proportion of the fibers are everywhere locally soluble. So I don't know, is, is this condition enough to guarantee that a 100% satisfy the Hasso principle? I haven't thought about that. Okay, um, maybe I should discuss a little bit about N less than D. Um, okay, so that's completely off the cards. Uh, Poonin and Volokh also conjectured that if you're in the world of general type varieties, 0% um, of them should have a solution over Q. So interestingly here, um, it's certainly true that a positive proportion of them are everywhere locally soluble, so we expect failures of the Hasse principle to dominate. But even writing down a single example where the Hasse principle fails um, is very, very difficult. Uh, we have some results in this direction, but they're all conditional on, on things like um, uh, ABC conjecture or other uh, Bombieri Lang type things. Um, one could also ask about special families. Um, so if the family becomes too special, then um, our methods. Uh, unfortunately break down, but there is some prior work in this direction. Um, so uh, Jörg Bruden and Rainer Dietmann uh, considered the case of diagonal hypersurfaces and under a slightly stronger condition on the relationship between N and D, so N is speaking now is 3D plus one, they're able to show that 100% of them satisfy the Hasse principle. Okay, so actually we were able to prove something slightly stronger than what I've revealed so far. Um, we can say something about uh, the existence of uh, small solutions. So let me write double lines F to be the height of a polynomial F. So the maximum modulus of the coefficients of the polynomial F. So there's a, uh, a classical result of Castle's about quadratic forms that states that if you have any non-singular isotropic quadratic form, then its least integer solution, its least, least non-trivial integer solution, always has Euclidean norm at most a constant times the height of Q to the n plus two, sorry, n over two. Um, so that's quite, Quite intriguing. So this gives a completely different uh, sort of solubility test to the Hasse principle. This is telling you that you know, I mean, if you wanted to know whether such a thing was soluble, you just have to run through all possible integer vectors up to this search range and uh, figure out whether you have a solution or not. And there's been work on improving the implied constant by, by several authors. And in fact, this is known to be best possible. So Knesa or Nisa. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, wrote down an example of a quadratic form uh, which had large height and whose smallest uh, solution had large height, um, matching this upper bound of castles. 
Um, however, if you look at the, the equation he writes, sorry, the polynomial he writes down, it's of a very special shape. And in fact, it actually has discri uh, discriminant one, determinant one. Uh, so it's very atypical. Um, so you might expect that on average, this isn't the true, uh, the true behavior. And this is sort of what we, we also managed to prove. Um, so again, the same assumptions on N and D, N is at least D, uh, we're not looking at cubic surfaces, unfortunately. And so when you order um, everywhere locally soluble degree D integer forms in N plus one variables, then 100% of these have a solution in which the, uh, the norm of this vector, the Euclidean length of this vector, is bounded by the height uh, to the one over n plus one minus d times something that goes to infinity slowly. Um, yes, yeah, so I promised there'd be some iterated logs. I think it's the only point at which they appear. Uh, so you can see that in the case d equals to two, uh, this is a much, uh, much smaller upper bound than what we're seeing in Castle's result. Uh, okay, so actually this chimes with uh, work of uh, Yuri Chinkel, Els and Hans and Yarnall. So they also uh, postulated the idea that uh, the point of least height on a Fano variety should be something like one over the Tamagawa measure. Um, it sort of coincides with that. Okay, uh, so let me talk a bit about uh, our approach to this. So studying the question of which polynomials actually have solutions uh, is quite, quite hard to do and things are smoothed out a lot by instead studying the average behavior of the associated counting function. <coughs> So we could define for a polynomial f, we could define n of b to just be the total number of primitive integer vectors in n plus one variables, which are solutions to the Diophantine equation f equal to zero, and which have norm at most b. So this is certainly a counting function that has proved uh, my bread and butter for many years, and I've thought about it in many different contexts. Um, and there have been uh, numerous incarnations of what one might expect for these kinds of counting functions. Um, so here's a conjecture, sort of inspired by the work of many people. Um, if we take the Fano range, so n is at least d, um, and f is one of these polynomials of degree d and n plus one variables. I'm going to assume that it's non-singular um, and that it, uh, it has Picard number one, so its Picard group is just z. Then one might expect that there's a positive constant. Oh, right. I, I need to assume that it has solutions, otherwise this problem is not very interesting. So one might expect that there's a positive constant such that this counting function behaves asymptotically like this constant times b to the n plus one minus d. So there's a fairly easy uh, heuristic argument for explaining the exponent n plus one minus d. I think in your wildest dreams, you might hope that uh, as in several other instances in analytic number theory that you actually have a square root error term. So there's a paper of Swinton and Dyer where he conjectures this for cubic surfaces, for example. I'm, I'm cheating here slightly because there's a, there are some issues around dealing with sharp cutoff functions. So there's a paper by Damara Schindler who um, demonstrates that you can get sort of intermediate lower order terms um, appearing in asymptotic formulae like this. But I think the consensus is that if you, uh, 
if you move away from sharp cutoff functions to something smoothly weighted, uh, like some uh, smooth weighted compact support, say, then those uh, lower order terms go away. And so maybe this is a, a reasonable conjecture to hope for. In fact, it's probably worth, it'd be interesting, probably very, very difficult to uh, think about, so, I mean, this is a, well, to th think about this in the context of uh, whether or not this error term, if you normalize the error term appearing in this asymptotic formula, uh, in the spirit of uh, Zev's talk a couple of weeks ago, where he talked about um, a conjecture of Blair and Dyson about sums of three squares, uh, it'd be very interesting to see whether there's any evidence for this normalized counting function to have a limiting distribution, the normalized error term to have a limiting distribution. Maybe a Gaussian distribution, why not? Um, but at least our, our work is consistent with this conjecture. So we basically have two parameters going to infinity in what we're doing. There's the A, which is the height of the polynomial. And then there's the B, which is the, uh, if you like, the height of the rational solution to the equation. Um, so we have to take A in a certain range with respect to B, and all of the work is concerned with dealing with the case where A is close to the left-hand inequality. So, Indeed, that's the situation where you expect there to be the fewest number of rational points, in fact. So the basic process or the basic point of view is to try and to start by constructing a convenient localized counting function, which I'm just going to denote by n log of b. And this counting function has got to be rich enough, this localized counting function has got to be rich enough that it approximates our expectation for what the uh, leading behavior should be in the Manning conjecture, but easy enough that we can actually work with it. Um, so that took a bit of doing to get that right. Um, but you can essentially think of it as a, uh, a truncated singular series um, and a truncated singular integral coming from the circle method. So the first step and uh, the most important step is to study the mean square of the difference between the counting function and the localized counting function as we average over all of these polynomials, homogeneous polynomials of degree D in n plus one variables. Um, and then the result that we are able to prove is, uh, is that basically we get a square root error term on average whenever we're dealing with um, this range that n is at least d and now we have to exclude the case of plane conics and plane cubics sorry cubic surfaces um, yes i think in earlier iterations of of, of talks i've given about this um, uh, we've been at we, I'll, I'll say a bit more about this in a minute, but we've been stuck at the n being at least d plus two. And handling the case n is equal to d uh, becomes harder and harder as, as, the, as, as n and d get smaller. Anyway, the upshot of this result is that it is rare for our counting function to not be well approximated by our localized counting function. Now, Going hand in hand with that is um, an analysis of the localized counting function itself. So we want to show that it is rare for the localized counting function um, to be smaller than we expect it to be. Okay, now the, the one issue here is that actually we know that for a positive proportion of polynomials of degree d and n plus one variables, this localized counting function vanishes. So it certainly can be small. Um, and it's here that we really need to work 
under the assumption that we're only restricting attention to uh, polynomials which pass all of the local tests for solubility. So we're looking at, uh, so this curly F lock is now the restricted set of everywhere locally soluble polynomials of degree D in n plus one variables and height A. So this estimate um, tells you that it's rare uh, for this localized counting function to be smaller than we expect it to be, and yet still everywhere locally soluble. So I'm not going to talk about the proof of this, but it really goes back to what we saw on the second or third slide involving Hensel's lemma. So Hensel's lemma told us that you know, when you're in a situation that the p-adic valuations of the partial derivatives are small, uh, then you can lift points. You can lift points to get many p-adic points on your hypersurface. So uh, the guts of the argument here is to sort of show that it's rare that you have polynomials which are locally soluble and yet, uh, and yet have uh, partial, all of their partial derivatives featuring uh, large prime powers. Okay, I wanted to focus a bit on the first step because this is the bit that involves the geometry of numbers. So I've just uh, recalled what the first step is here as a second moment bound. And the hardest range um, is, as you might expect, when A is roughly the same size as B to the N plus one minus D. So that's the case in which the leading constant in the expected asymptotic formula for NF of B is you know, roughly one. Yeah, please excuse me. Um, we have a question or a comment from Zev Rudnik, if you don't oh. Zev, please, please ask your question. Uh, Tim, uh, so you have this two parameter family and ideally you would like to make a very small relative to b right because you're secretly trying to to capture what happens for an individual hypersurface mm -hmm. right that, um, but if i understand correctly you are forced to take a quite large which is as you say uh, what you call the hardest range that's the lower bound um, so you can't, and then you have this upper bound, which seems less important because uh, if I understand correctly, you want A to be small as possible. But if you give up on that, on that upper bound, could you make A smaller than this uh, power of D? Uh, I get, I'm not sure. Uh, I think, Yes. Well, it depends on what, sorry, can I interject? Oh, certainly will, thank you. what you're trying to prove. Like, what? Wait, no, wait, I may be confused myself. You're talking about making A very, very, very small, or B yeah. very small. Uh, ideally, you want, if I understand the philosophy, you really are trying, ideally, you would want to do this for an individual. A, yeah. A equal one. Yeah. Ideally, but of course we we can't. So you average, and so you try to average over as few possible hypersurfaces as you can, which means make A as small as you can while still making it grow with B. That's a philosophy, I would imagine. Yeah. But your force. Uh, so you have this constraint that A is essentially larger than what Tim calls the hardest range here. Uh, b to the n plus one minus d. So what is the obstacle to making a smaller? We, we don't know how to do it. Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> We're going to be reversing some order of summation and so then like we're trying, we're going to try to be getting cancellation in the sum over A that beats some kind of trivial bound somewhere else. Yeah. And you'll probably get a flavor for it on the next slide, actually. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so opening up this, uh, this uh, second moment, um, and here comes the interchanging of the order of summation, um, as promised. We 
yeah, the hardest term comes from looking at the average of uh, this counting function squared. And so we open that up um, and then we bring the, we interchange the order. So we're summing over now vectors X and Y primitive uh, size at most B. And we're now left with counting these, uh, these polynomials uh, which pass through these two points. Now that's a much easier problem. Um, after all, what are, I mean, what is the space of polynomials of degree D and N plus one variables? It's nothing other than a, than a vector space of coefficients, uh, a very big vector space of coefficients. Um, in fact, it has N choose N plus D uh, coordinates for a, a polynomial, homogeneous polynomial of degree D and N plus one variables. And uh, one can rewrite that problem as counting integers, integer vectors uh, of uh, modulus at most A, which satisfy these two linear equations. And the coefficients of the linear equations are just coming from the dth Veronese embedding of the two uh, points, um, if you like, in Pn. So uh, in principle, this is much easier. We're dealing now just with uh, counting solutions to linear equations. Um, and in fact, that's a, a lattice point counting problem. So let me write capital N for this binomial coefficient. Um, and assuming that we, we don't have proportional um, vectors x and y, this set, this set of coefficient vectors which satisfy these two linear equations is actually a lattice. And it actually has rank n minus two, we're cutting up two conditions. And its determinant is roughly the products of the Euclidean norms of these two coefficient vectors, nu x and nu y. So the Veronese embedding takes you to degree D monomials. So this um, determinant is roughly uh, the norm of X to the D times the norm of Y to the D. So now we look up our favorite results about lattice point counting um, in the literature. There are many, um, I guess I'm in Austria now, so I turn to Wolfgang Schmidt. And he tells us that the number of lattice points in this box grows like the volume, a to the n minus two times a constant, uh, divided by the co-volume of this lattice. And the error term is very explicit. It's just of the shape one plus um, a sum involving uh, smaller exponents of a and the successive minima of this lattice lambda. So remember the kth successive minimum of, uh, of a lattice is just the, uh, the minimum radius of a ball containing k linearly independent lattice points. Okay, um, so that's the kind of result we want to apply. I've written it again at the top of the slide here. Um, and again, we're, we're dealing with this hard range uh, where a is roughly of size b to the n plus one minus d. So the leading term, the main term in, in, uh, in Schmidt's result, uh, we, we can see that that's bigger than a to the n minus two divided by the co-volume. We saw that the co-volume was like uh, x to the, the norm of x to the d times the norm of y to the d. Um, x and y are both typically of size b, uh, so the denominator there we would expect to be typically of size b to the 2d. So that's the sort of lower bound for this main term. And I mean, we're trying to, uh, we're doing a sort of dispersion method. So we need asymptotic formulae for each of the terms that comes out of squaring, up, opening up the square in the, uh, in the second moment. So we need to know precisely when this main term is actually bigger than the error term. So, one thing we can do is observe that uh, we are working with integer lattices, lattices which lie inside Zn. And in particular, all of the vectors in the lattice are integer vectors, and they all have Euclidean length at least one. So we can certainly trivially take the lower bound, lambda one is greater than or equal to one, lambda two is greater than or equal to one. And in that way, we see that this error term is bounded above by a to the n minus three. So if I restrict attention to this uh, particularly awkward range where a is of size b to the n plus one minus d, and you compare when that main term dominates the error term, you find that 
you need n plus 1 minus d to be bigger than 2d. So you need n to be at least 3d for this argument to work. So that's similar to the 3d that we saw in the, in the, the result by uh, Bruden and, and Deidman. And I think this also shows why, why you can't expect to do very well unless your a is sort of sufficiently large in terms of b. Okay, well, we know rather a lot about successive minima of lattices, it's a very classical topic. Uh, so the largest successive minima is always bounded above by the product of the successive minima. The product of the successive minima by uh, an estimate of Minkowski is bounded above and below by absolute constants or constants depending on um, uh, the rank by the determinant of the lattice. And we've seen already that this determinant is roughly uh, x to the d, y to the d. So in what I've described at the top of the, the, the slide, the very worst case for us is when this largest successive minima is basically the co-volume of the lattice and all of the other successive minima are one. So if we can improve that situation, if we can get better control over the largest successive minima, we will a fortiori push up the size of the smallest successive minima and, um, uh, and get, in principle, a sharper upper bound for this error term, which will allow us to handle ultimately a better range of n and d. So I've deliberately not left any time to describe the proof of the following result, but this is the sort of key uh, technical lemma that underpins um, the paper, essentially. Um, and this states that yeah, provided that you're dealing with linearly independent vectors, integer vectors, then you can always bound this successive minima, the largest successive point, in fact, all of the successive minima, um, by the product of the norm of x and the norm of y uh, divided by something which is a, which, uh, which divided by something which is certainly at least one, um, but could in principle be larger. So this is true for any of these lattices. Um, and I think in our earlier versions, we didn't have the denominator in this upper bound for the largest successive minima. Um, but with this denominator, you now get into the, the, the region. And in fact, proving, the, sorry, proving that upper bound with one in the denominator is relatively easy. You, just, uh, you can actually construct by hand n minus two linearly independent vectors inside this lattice, which have norm at most. Uh, the norm of x times the norm of y. Um, but getting this improvement here is, is more complicated. I'm not going to describe it here. And then it leads you to exploit the fact that we are, in fact, actually just trying to understand the size of this successive minima on average as we average over x and y. And in fact, you can gain leverage by showing that there are, um, there are relatively few x and y for which, uh, say, uh, D3 um, of x, y is very small. And then when you carry this all out uh, and um, push it and, and squeeze as much as you can out of it, you ultimately get to the sort of statements of the main result that I was mentioning. But I think I'm out of time. Thanks very much.